heart of Wellington, Kansas, Powder and String Outfitters is your down-home, one-stop shop for all things shooting sports and outdoors. Welcome to the Powder and String Podcast. I would like to welcome everybody back to the Powder and String Podcast. I'm your host, Kip Etter, and I'm in the studio downtown Wellington, Kansas, and I am joined today with Jana Waller. And uh, Jana, I greatly appreciate you coming on here and uh, talk talk hunting and everything in between and uh, kind of see where this thing takes us and, and where we can go from there. But maybe to get started, if you want to just... Uh, Maybe tell our listeners out there a little bit about yourself. Um, if there's anybody out there that hasn't heard of you, um, you're, you're, you've got a lot of different stuff going on and, <laughs> and uh, you can be found in a lot of different places. Well, thanks for having me. It's always, I could talk hunting all day long, you know, 24 seven. So we will not have a problem finding topics to talk about. That's for sure. Um, I uh, grew up in Wisconsin, so I'm a Midwestern gal and I was the second daughter of, uh, I think, a father who really wanted a son. And that's always kind of how I do an intro. Uh, my dad, I joke about this, and I don't even know if I should anymore in today's culture, but I'm still going to do it. Um, my dad always jo- joked that he wanted a son so bad he turned me into one. But really what it was is seeing in me this innate love of out being outdoors. Um, my sister and I could not be more opposite. She was very indoorsy, always had very cerebral, always had her head buried in a book. And I was always out catching frogs, playing in the mud. And so my dad really fostered my love of nature and uh, would let me, you know, go pheasant hunting with him as a kid, sit in the duck blinds with him in in Wisconsin. And he started archery whitetail hunting when I was in high school. So I would sit in the trees with him and, uh, you know, have fun. But I didn't actually pick up a bow until my freshman year in college. And that was, oh, oh, oh. Let's just say it was in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I've been bow hunting over 30 years, and uh, it truly is something that it has, it's the biggest part of my life. I turned it into a career about 14 years ago, um, but I, it, it's been just such a blessing to grow up bird hunting and spending time outdoors with my dad. And then when I was in college, picked up a bow and just got hooked the first year, I arrowed a doe and well, actually, it was a nubbed buck that I thought was a doe, um, but it couldn't have been, you know, it could have been a greater gift from my dad because it's truly right. what my life has revolved around since and career wise and, and interest wise. It's the bond that holds my dad and I together. And uh, I've just been really blessed. And then I started my TV show Skullbound about 14 years ago. I was uh, living in Wisconsin. I met my uh, then boyfriend slash cameraman slash editor. Um, we had both written articles for Bowhunter magazine together. That's how we met. And um, I had gone through a divorce and he had gone through a divorce. And we talked about this idea of starting my, an, a show that was a female hosted hunting show. And at the time, there really weren't that many. And uh, so we filmed for six, seven months, put together a pilot, pitched that pilot to the Sportsman's Channel. And Skullbound was on the Sports Channel for nine years. And then I merged over to Carbon TV, which is digital, almost six years ago now. And it's been just a complete and utter blessing the last 13, 14 years of my life. Yeah. Being able to to not not really work because you're out doing things you love and dream and 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 hunting. I don't know if I would agree if it's not really Having well, a full time changes things. Yes, <laughs> but I can it relate is a to complete that. Bless. I'm just joking. I'm I am, but I'm not. It's a lot of work, um, especially to you know just keep the to, the train going down the tracks and yeah. and keep it as exciting as you want it, and yet working really hard, like always having a camera, you know, following you around and planning yeah. your travel. And I do a minimum of twelve episodes a year, usually thirteen or fourteen mm-hmm. episodes a year. So it's a lot, but you're right. It is a complete blessing to do what you love. And and I've just been I feel like with life in general, everything is timing. And it was such a wonderful time to be a yeah. female in the hunting industry, to um, you know, step into uh, an industry that I really didn't know a ton about the industry. Obviously I knew a ton about hunting because I'd been hunting 
20 plus years before that. But I've learned so much about the industry as a whole, um, goods and bads, ins and outs. And it's just been a real blessing to, like I said, keep that train moving down the tracks, you know, 14 years later. Yeah. And, and you're exactly right. Um, you know, when we started powder and string, um, we're coming up on real quickly on three years ago. Um, anybody that all, ever, all my friends and family said, well, we knew when you were going to start a, you know, just a little shop, it, there was not going to be anything little about it. Um, <laughs> and so it turned into really quick to, you know, here we are, you know, with our own podcast and, um, the same thing, you know, we're out hunting and, and we're, you know, gathering content, which I'd done a little bit of, you know, um, self-filming before, but it just completely and totally changes everything. And I can totally relate to what you're saying with regards to, you know, trying to keep the train rolling. And, and it is a job. Um, my wife often jokes with me. She's like, you know, now you've, you know, you've, you've said you were going to clean your plate and, and, and do, or clear your plate a little bit and do have less, less, uh, wear less hats, but now you've got, you know, the social media and that social media, it, 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 it's gotta be, you know, you've got to stay on it. It's got to be constant. You've got to be doing stuff all the time, mm-hmm. putting content out there to keep your, your, your name there. And it's not like it used to be, um, you know, and I, I'm, I wasn't in it. Like it sounds like you were, but you know, back when it was print media, you, you would just do limited stuff and writings and stuff. And it was kind of at your, you know, at your leisure somewhat, but oh, now yeah. it's, yeah, it's, you've got to stay active and, and posting stuff all the time. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's very constant. No doubt. I, uh, it's funny because I, you know, in my adult life, in my early 20s, there was no internet, <laughs> and right. there was no social media, which I, have, I often joke about the beautiful days of no internet. And even though, yeah. yes, it is my job and it's my social media and my show on Carbon TV is my job and I need the internet and it's a wonderful thing. It connects people. At the same time, when I'm on a hunt and disconnected and have no cell service, where yeah. I'm, you know, in the back country or in Alaska, or something, it's a beautiful thing. And it's yeah. a love-hate relationship, right? But it is a ton of work. And um, I feel really lucky in terms of um, what I do because I, some, every show is different, right? And, and right. part of the reason I wanted to start a, a solo female hosted show was number one to show that we hunters are are animal lovers. I've been involved in conservation since I was a teenager. My yep. dad took me to all his pheasants forever, Ducks Unlimited banquets. I was doing skull art before I was doing skull art for the masses. I was doing it to donate, to raise money back to hunters. And I just yeah. felt like it was what was really missing in TV land was the idea that we're animal lovers and that we're the ones who fund conservation for animals Absolutely. across this country. You know, the North American model of conservation is, is basically highlighting hunters dollars going back through not just our conservation groups, but purchasing the license, buying, you know, stamps Absolutely. and tags and all the billions of dollars that we hunters have raised to go back to the herds and the flocks and the habitat. That's what I wanted to feature on Skullbound. And, Love it. um, It has been a total blessing. But what I was going to say about that is some shows are, how big is your buck? It's all about the big white tails. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of shows like that. And I love them just as much. More power to them. I didn't want a show that that was all about the trophy. I wanted a show that showed a variety of hunting. I mean, I hunt with a bow. I actually started archery hunting before I ever picked up a gun. But I hunt with a bow, rifle, shotgun, muzzleloader. I even pistol hunt. Yeah, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about your pistols. because I've watched your shows and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm totally, um, that's right up my alley. And I'm, I'm much like you. I have only, um, I've only to date shot one deer ever with a rifle. Um, and I own a gun shop. Um, <laughs> we are, well, we're also archery as well, powder, gunpowder and bowstring. But yeah. um, we, I'm an archery guy. And then we started as a gun shop and now we're expanding. We're in an old downtown building um, in a historic, you know, historic downtown. So it's an old creaky floor. And, um, I've got, I own, uh, the building right next door. So we're in the process of expanding and adding archery. But, um, when I was back in college a long, long time ago, um, in the nineties, I, uh, the, 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 the farmer's ground I was hunting on said, if you're going to come out and go, you know, hunting for bucks, you got to come back out in the summertime and shoot the does. Um, so he had some nuisance tags. So I shot one, one doe one time with a rifle but other than that you know i'm i started and and now with again you know talking about you know keeping the train rolling um i'm going to be adding 
you know, our uh, rifle into the mix so that way we can get more content because, you know, sure. in Kansas, you know, you're just limited one buck. So um, obviously we're doing some traveling and stuff this next, this upcoming year and stuff like that. But um, I can very much relate to that. And then with regards to the pistol, I, uh, I'm a big pistol guy, revolver guy, like, like that. Um, recently got one of my dream guns, Ruger 454, um, Alaskan super red Hawk. Just love it. Nice. It's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Well, it adds to the, the hunts, you know, you could, the more you can do, it's not just getting content. It's like, wait, I, I'm not done. I want to hunt more. You know, I want to, yeah, if right. I wasn't yeah. successful with bow, like Wisconsin, for example, you've got the whole season of bow hunt, and then you can also have a gun tag. And then if you don't fill that rifle tag, you could then bo- muzzle loader tag. So that's like, the same way it is it, in Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. It just adds to the hunt. And I honestly, I'll stand by this. I, like I said, I've been an archer for over 30 years. There's just as much skill if you're a long range rifle hunting as there is in bow hunting. Um, Mm -hmm. You're sitting in a tree, you're looking for that, you know, 40 yards or under typically shot. And not to say there's not skill there, of course there is. But when you're long distance rifle hunting, it's not just pot shotting. You are Mm -hmm. shooting at a live, beautiful animal. It takes precision. And before Mm -hmm. I moved out West, you know, I hunted with a gun a little bit in Wisconsin, but we never had a shot over a hundred yards where we hunted. Um, Is Wisconsin one of the straight, straight wall states? Uh, the straight wall cartridge, is it a straight wall cartridge state? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? Is Wisconsin a straight wall cartridge state? Some of those eastern rust belt states are, uh, you can't have uh, tapered walled cartridges. So it has to be like a, a 4570 or a, a 45 Colt or, you know, you can't have any of the tapered like 223 or 556 or 243 or 270. I think um, you can. I think you can. Uh, I'm not okay. sure on that, actually. Um, I, I know haven't... Ohio and Illinois... I'm pretty sure are both straight wall. I think Pennsylvania might be a straight wall cartridge yeah. state, but like the 450 Bushmaster and the 350 Legend, those those rounds, um, that's they're a straight wall cartridge for rifle uh, yeah. if you're deer hunting. I'm not sure. I've always hunted. I started out with a 243 classic deer mm-hmm. rifle round, and then um, got the 26 Nosler. Oh, I actually then I got a 300, which I like because it bumps you up mm-hmm. a little bit for elk and deer and bear. Right. Um, but then I, I went moved over to the line of Noslers. I shoot really basically I shoot just the 28 right now in terms of a rifle. Um I love the 28 Nosler. It has taken down every animal you see behind me, uh, you know, moose, elk, bear, whatever. It's just such a great round. Obviously a little overkill for some deer and antelope, but at right. the same time I windy conditions, I'd rather have overkill than underkill. But um I just think that I, I'm I I'm not a judgmental person. I think social media tends for people to get super judgmental. Oh, I'm just a trad bow hunter guy, or I'm just an archer, or I, whatever. I don't care what you do as long as it's legal, um, as long as it's ethical. Again, that comes into people's perspective in terms of, but right. ethical meaning you're making an ethical shot. You're practicing with that weapon. You're, um, you know, you're not shooting in conditions you're not used to. When I moved out to Montana uh, from Wisconsin, I lived in Montana for 13 years before I just moved here to Utah. But I wanted to train right away. I didn't want to go out. We did spot and stalk bear every season. It's over the counter. And oftentimes you're on a canyon shooting across canyon. You're shooting four or 500 yards across windy conditions, elevation. You know, you want to get that dope right. So you're not wounding mm-hmm. an animal, tracking down a bear in the thicket. And I trained with Nemo Arms was the first company, a gun company that I trained with up in near Kalispell, Montana. I did a three-day yeah. training round with them. It was awesome. By special, these special forces guys who were just so incredibly knowledgeable um, yeah, Nemo makes I've done good a couple stuff. of different long range training uh, classes and I just think it's important. I don't think, I think there's just as much skill that goes into really knowing a long range rifle as it does with archery. And again, with pistol too, pistol hunting. I started pistol hunting about six years ago. Um, one, because I hurt my shoulder and two, because I had got introduced to Magnum Research at SHOT Show. And I thought that'd be really cool. You know, it's about the same range distance that I'm comfortable with. I don't shoot over 50 yards. I don't shoot over 50 with my pistols. And I, uh, they had a new round that they wanted to kind of introduce, which is the 429. And I thought, yeah, heck yeah, the thing looks like a beast. And I bear hunt a ton. I run my own baits in Idaho. And mm-hmm. so started pistol hunting about six years ago. And that has just been super fun. I, uh, I've taken bear, mountain lion, hogs, javelina. Um, it's just been super fun. I just got, you'll like this, I just got a BFR uh, 3030 from um, Car or Biggest Finest Revolver. 
in yeah. this beautiful long barreled revolver. It's the first revolver I've ever had. So yeah. I'm looking forward to hunting some bears with that this spring in Idaho. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And and you, you backing up just a little bit, you also touched base with regards to and spoke and about the conservation and the amount of funds and, and dollars that are raised by sportsmen and hunters. And, and that's something that we, you know, you're echoing exactly what we've talked about here on the podcast a lot is that, um, that those dollars and those conservation groups, we don't, I, I've always said, I don't care whether it's ducks unlimited or Rocky mountain elk or, um, you know, Dallas Safari club Turkey in NWTF, any of them, um, we support of them a lot. We support any of them that are around in Kansas here, um, or Northern Oklahoma, um, mm -hmm. we're associated with them, um, uh, friends of the NRA as well. Um, yep. but it, it, whether you're an archery hunter or whether you're uh, a boat, I mean, a, a rifle hunter, whatever you hunt, you, you need to go to those and, and be a part of it because they all, um, you, you know, have their intricate pieces, but they're all greater, you know, there's a greater cause and, right. you know, the hunting, you know, and, and I think social media as well is kind of one of them things where it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because people's attention span is so short that mm -hmm. they just sometimes focus on the, you know, the kill shot. And there's so much more that led up to that. I mean, months and months of, of preparation and work and scouting and all of that different stuff. And yep. so uh, it's, 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 uh, that's one of the things that I can, I can tell you that I've, I've seen your shows and stuff like that, watched them. And, and I like that you're, there's a story to it as opposed to, you know, back in the day when I was, you know, first watching, I, I can remember when I was a kid, I grew up kind of in a rural area and we got a satellite dish. Um, you know, the old, like literally the big, huge one in the backyard that, yep. yeah. And you, and you know, Satcom F5 and you'd push this and we were lucky cause ours actually, you know, had digital, you know, um, with electric, had electric motors would so move. Yeah. Um, and so I remember I was about probably 14 or 15 when dad got that. And so I could start watching hunting shows, um, occasionally here and there, you know, or on ESPN, you know, on Sunday mornings or Saturday mornings, they'd had hunting shows, but the difference between those shows and these are those shows were, were very about because the audience was already hunters. Yeah. So it was very to the point and we're shooting this big animal and then they're showing that. And so it was very abridged and short. Whereas now with digital media, we can have, you know, unlimited content uh, out there and show the whole story. Um, yeah. And I like that. I, I like that. That's what one of the things that the internet has brought because there's so many people out there that are against what we're, you know, what we're doing and they don't realize that we're the biggest animal lovers there are. Um, oh, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm sure you're much like me when I take an animal's life, it's, it's emotional. It's, yep. it's a big deal. It's not, um, it's not uncommon for me to, you know, shed a tear every single time I walk up and, you know, I have a prayer. Um, it's a big deal. I, I don't take lightly, um, that I'm, I'm harvesting that animal. And, uh, it's, that's why they call it hunting, not killing. And I say that often. Um, but you know, I think, uh, was it Teddy Roosevelt that had a, had a, uh, a quote of something about, uh, the, the sportsmen's are the reasons for, are the greatest conservationists that are out there and raising money, something along those lines. I'll have to look it up, but, oh, yeah. um, yeah, it's it makes just... me think of um, Jack Hanna. Most people know who Jungle Jack mm -hmm. Hanna is. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. he is out of the public eye now. He has, um, I believe, dementia or Alzheimer's. But I met Jungle Jack Hanna through mutual friends a few years ago. Been to his house in Montana. He is a, he, for the public eye, know him as Jungle Jack Hanna, this animal lover, curator of the mm -hmm. Ohio Zoo. Um, and he is all that. And, uh, and a great guy. And yet very supportive of conservation-based hunter groups. He, I interviewed him for an episode of Skullbound years back, and he said right on camera, I'm proud to say hunters are the greatest conservationists on that planet, on this planet. And to hear that from someone like Jungle Jack Hanna, that's mm -hmm. powerful. That's powerful stuff. Someone who knows how uh, the North American conservation model works. And mm -hmm. I just feel like it's so missed on social media and TV yes. shows and, and stuff like that. And, uh, to me, I belong, my husband and I actually added it up a few weeks ago. We collectively belong to 15 different conservation groups and uh, proudly. And they all, they all, like you said, have their individual niches, whether you're Ducks Unlimited or Pheasants. They obviously do a lot for duck habitat. 
you know, and pheasants, for pheasant habit, but they also do a lot in working together that a lot of people don't see stuff that's yes. fighting the ridiculous court cases, mm-hmm. um, groups like groups that may be not w- as well known, but do so much good work. Groups like Sportsman's Alliance, Howl.org. Howl.org is a new one that I think everybody needs to belong to because they keep track of, especially out West, What's going on with the predator issues? What's going on with the commission issues? Because that's a big highlighted thing right now with yes. Colorado releasing their wolves. Um, and Howl.org, uh, Bo- uh, Blood Origins is another great group. Not necessarily a, yes, they're a conservation group, but they have incredible films out there. They have an incredible program where you can donate monthly, five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever you can, to keep up the fight. And the fight is education. And on social media, the fight is in the courtrooms and we all need to be involved in groups like this. We all need to support a variety of groups like Mule Deer Foundation, NWTF, all of those, because they they collectively work together. And if we don't stand a little bit stronger and taller together, we're going to crumble because of the culture that we're dealing with right now. They want to shut down. That's why I chose Carbon TV, actually. When I went off network after nine years, I went digital because I think that's the way. I know that's the wave of TV. Absolutely. People don't want to pay for big subscriptions, you know. But I didn't want to go to YouTube because I have so many friends who've had their channels shut down, not just gun channels, hunting channels, predator shows. I do a ton of predator hunting. I didn't want to get put all my eggs in one basket, go to YouTube and have it shut me down. And so that's why I went to Carbon TV and they have just exploded in the last five years. I also have a fast channel. So I have Skullbomb Chronicles, which is Mm -hmm. all my new episodes that after I went from network to digital, that's Skullbomb Chronicles where you can pick and choose what episode you want to watch. I then have my own channel that Carbon TV helped me create their getting new into the fast channel scene where they have all tons of fast channels on their network where it's like a regular channel. You just put it on and it's rotating episodes of, you know, over hundred episodes that just rotate and it's really fun. And they've helped me pitch that channel. So I'm on 31 networks right now from local now to rewarded TV and so, some other big ones that as well as on carbon TV, a fast channel. And it's so much fun to like today I was working out on the treadmill this morning and never knowing what episode's going to come up. There was my, you know, Florida alligator show and my bighorn ram show and, you know, catching spoonbill fish and you kind of never know what you're going to see. But in those episodes, you're going to see that connection to conservation and standing really tall behind what we hunters do. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And that's, um, we're, we, we've actually, um, we're, back and forth in emails and stuff, um, uh, with carbon TV about getting, getting on carbon as well. Um, yeah. we're, we're currently, I don't know if the right words, not negotiations, but just, um, trying to get, uh, you know, both of us get on the same page and, and what we need to do in order to get on there. Great. Um, yeah. They've got I a think, great new podcast program on, on yeah. carbon. it's not just TV, but the great new, like, obviously there's so many great hunting and fishing podcasts out there, but it's nice to have them all in one stop shop at carbon Absolutely. TV. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're exactly right with regards to one of the things that we, that our industry doesn't do. And it's something that I've always been a part of those conservation groups. I've always been a hunter, but I've never been, um, this involved, I guess would be probably the right, you know, once you get into the media side, uh, social media side, the, the, the doing podcast and interviews and you start meeting, you know, uh, hosts and influencers and stuff like that, then you start, you know, seeing a whole different side of it. Um, as well as manufacturers and the sales side of it, we're not really good at being organized and working together. And mm-hmm. the other side, and I hate to say that, but the people that are anti-hunting and that are against, you know, anti-gun, they are very, very well organized. Yes, and they, they, are. And they, they have are, millions and millions behind them. Yes, they do. And, you know, that's the thing that, if you know, this is, this is, um, I mean, it's, it, it's in our, it, it's in our DNA. It's, yep. you know, not just ours. I'm talking as human beings. It's in, it's just, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, just about anybody that's been fishing. Once you get that little nibble on the, on the line, it's that, you know, that, that feeling that you just feel, and I don't care if it's a little, you know, little cra- uh, perch or a crappie or a bass, or if you're, you know, you know, saltwater fishing, um, it's the same thing when you're hunting, if you've never been hunting and you've never had that experience of all of a sudden here comes in this, you know, this turkey or this deer or whatever, and you just get that, 
that feeling over you. It's just, it's very primal and it's, you know, it's something it's, it's instinctual. Um, and that's something that, that it's been with us, you know, uh, if you don't look for, you know, it's only been what the last hundred, 125 years where all of a sudden we've had the privileges and the, and the, 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 um, processed the, foods. <laughs> yeah. Processed foods, but even the convenience and the luxury, yeah. there's the word I was looking for was luxury, the luxury of being able to go to a supermarket, you know, it's only been yep. that long. And so this was the way it's been since, you know, Adam and Eve. And then I've all of a sudden, said that. I couldn't yeah. agree more that connection, that connection to our past connection to all the generations before us that had to struggle to f find meat. I mean, think about when you think about the pioneers or the wagon train, they would send out scouts to go hunt and he coming mm -hmm. back with even a rabbit, squirrel, deer yes. was incredible. Fresh meat was such a delicacy back in the day. And I do, I've always said that I've always felt so more connected to, um, you know, the earth, people when you and hunting especially out west when you're climbing the mountains and you're pushing your body to the physical extremes or even the midwest too when you're you're sitting in frigid temperatures and you're getting up and walking out to your tree stand five in the morning you know you're uncomfortable or you're sitting all day because it's the rut or you're mm -hmm. pushing your body you know to maybe pass that comfortable stage there's there is something that makes you think wow what was it like back in the day when you couldn't walk into a grocery store when you couldn't you know open up the pantry and have it stocked with you know unfortunately you know pop tarts and anything else pre processed that we sick that we could go into that whole other discussion right. about how healthy li hunters live such healthier lives but um yeah i do think about that all the time about the challenges of the hunt and how it makes me appreciate how easy my life is if I want it to be easy. I don't. I like, I just got off a 17 day mountain goat hunt. Trust me. It was the That's hardest a... hunt of my entire life. Oh yeah. But when it was all said and done and I notched that tag, tears were flowing. I just ate New Year's Eve. I made mountain goat curry, the very last of the meat. Cause I've eaten it all fall. Um, it is special to be able to bring that food into your home and fill your freezers. And, and you th reflect back, I had friends over for New Year's Eve and reflecting on the hunt and how, what an amazing opportunity it was in the first yeah. place. And it just makes you, I think hunting more than anything else that I've ever experienced in my life makes me just so appreciative of my life as a whole the food that I've got, the people I'm around, the beautiful wildlife our country has. Oh. It just makes me so much more appreciative of my life in general. Yes, I 100% agree. And that's the thing too, is, is that when you're, you're talking about cooking the, the, the animal that you, you know, you harvested and it doesn't matter what it is that you harvested. It, it's, it's just so different than, you know, just having that hamburger, um, you know, from McDonald's or whatever. And, you know, don't get me wrong. There's times where I'm in a, in a hurry and I'm hungry and I got to, you know, got to eat. So mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. I don't mind having me a, a McDonald's hamburger and, and some French fries, but it's not common. And to go out and harvest it, it makes the, 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 the animal that lost its life to me much more meaningful that, that I'm appreciative of that. And I see that. Whereas, you know, I grew up on a farm and don't get me wrong. There's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very in tune with the food chain and how it works, you know, and where this, you know, where it comes from. But, um, I, I'm from this area here in the Midwest, but at one point I lived in Phoenix and, and I remember when I lived out there, this was in the early two thousands that they, um, there was an initiative that passed voters passed that, um, it was restricting the crating of, of hogs. Um, and it wouldn't allow them to be, they had to not be crated and, it, and it passed overwhelmingly. And the part that was so weird was, is that the people that voted for that probably much, I'm um, not probably much like the wolf situation oh, in Colorado yeah. is, is that the people that were voting for it had no idea the ramifications of what was going on. And that the, the farmers, um, they're, they're for profit. So they're, they're going to do what's best for the herd and what's going to get, you know, what's going to save the most lives and, and, and put, you know, let, let the animals grow healthy and, and all of that stuff. And so this initiative that passed, it basically didn't allow the, the, the sows to be able to be in any kind of a crate. So when they went to, to lay down, they were squashing and killing piglets. Um, so it was, had the complete and total opposite effect. 
And so the Farm Bureau, the, the State Farm Bureau did a study and they found that I think it was like over 50 percent of the people were third generation removed from the farm and yeah. that it was like 80 percent or 90 percent were were fifth generation removed. I'm sorry, just the opposite, that 50 percent were um, were three generations removed or I'm sorry, five generations removed. And then the 90 percent was was more. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm mixing it up, but you understand what yeah. I'm saying? Oh yeah. Trust me. I totally understand. So I was, <laughs> and a they, wildlife they couldn't connect that. They couldn't oh. connect that, that burger that they're eating at McDonald's or they're getting from that. It came from a cow or came from a farm or they just, they literally did not have that connection. Yep. Couldn't, couldn't get it. I was a Montana wildlife commissioner before I moved to Utah. So I've had many conversations. I felt like I owed it as a commissioner to talk to all the groups. And there were a lot of, you know, a lot of, obviously hunter groups that I talked to, but there were a lot of non-hunting group people that I spoke with as well mm -hmm. and wolf lovers. And, and trust me when I say there is such a disconnect in the reality of the back country. That's what I call mm -hmm. it. Those are my words, but the, the reality of the wild of wildlife and what happens in the wild, just like ranching, just like farming. There is, if you're not from a ranching family, hunting family, a farmer family, you often have such a complete disconnect of what it, life is like on the farm for the hardworking individuals that work there, as well as the animals or a disconnect of the animals in the wildlife. I have personally, I've seen many a wolves in the wild. I, um, I've seen, I've seen many of the documentaries made about the wolves in Yellowstone. I watched a pack of wolves hamstring a herd of elk. And in the course of one month, killing over 30 big bulls this pack. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen it with my own two eyes. There's no arguing that wolves, for example, are a beautiful animal, but there is so much misinformation about how they act as packs. And, when and you, they didn't when consume, you, they didn't consume all of the meat either, did they? Oh, no, 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 no. And, you know, for, for example, this, this is a point I often made with the wolf loving groups is I, yes, they're beautiful. I think they absolutely have a place on the landscape. But if we're not allowed to manage them, soon it's going to be where they're, where it's already happening in a lot of the other areas yep. in, the, in the West. Soon you're going to see elk populations dwindle. The, yep. su the sustainability of the calves, the fawns, and then it becomes to where it's a flip-flop. And if that, when you think about that pack of wolves, that pack can have two packs in a year. And that can be anywhere mm -hmm. from a couple of pups to a dozen. And mm -hmm. that poor cow elk is having one, maybe two calves. Most likely one calf survives, not the two. And Correct. then that's in the course of a year. And their survival rate often is less than 50%. Mm -hmm. So when you look at what's going to happen in five years of that pack of wolves compared to that herd of elk, it's... It, they have to be managed. It's that simple. Yeah. And then and, it's going to uh, decimate the elk population. And then at that point, then the fishing game is going to have no, 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 no other option than to reduce the tags, which then reduces the, well, you know, the, the, the money outcome. coming in. And, that's yeah, their the hotel desired rooms outcome. And, yeah. It's not to have wolves on the landscape. It's to not have hunting. And yep. you can see the effects of the wolves in northern Wisconsin, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Yellowstone National Park. It, it goes on and on. But But back to your point. I can't agree more that there is such a disconnect of the non-hunting population of where their food comes from. And yep. I think hunters, I know hunters better than anybody and ranchers and farmers understand that connection and understand the hard work involved and have such a respect. And also we're the ones who want to make sure that our lifestyle is sustainable. We want our grandkids to be able to go out and find Absolutely. herds of elk and, and have healthy herds of whitetails that are not overpopulated or underpopulated. You know, we want to make sure that we manage the coyotes, the bobcats, the mountain lions. And it's all so int intricate and no one understands that and appreciates that better than hunters. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with you. It's, uh, it's something that, you know, if you're into the shooting, hunting, outdoors, in any capacity, um, it's something that you're, you're gonna have to stand up for it because yep. it's, 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 it's definitely under attack and it, and it's continuing to be, it's, the attack is growing, the size in, oh. in numbers and funds being tossed towards it. You better believe it. There, you know, the anti-hunting groups, 
first of all, they're often masqueraded. The One of the biggest anti-hunting groups in this country is the HSUS, the Humane Society of the yep. United States. They are yeah. not your local Humane Society, which I completely support. You, you I know, do the too. local pounds, the local Humane Societies Absolutely. who are, yep. that is not what HSUS is. In fact, if you go onto the HSUS, I haven't gone on in a year or two, but if you used to be able to go on and there was a watchdog warning that popped up, uh, un, you know, not to their liking, but they, HSUS is the most crooked anti-hunting group on the planet. They raise so much money because people think they're doing a good thing by donating to the Humane Society of the United States. Of course, we are all dog and cat lovers, but that's not what they are. They're, they're, they spend their dollars in the courtrooms trying to stop all kinds of hunting, trying mm -hmm. to, you know, one of their most recent court cases was to try to say that it's cruel to have dogs bird hunt, that dog, they shouldn't, Anyone who owns a bird dog knows how much they love it. They oh. live for it. It's in their DNA. It's not cool. Yeah. It's what they live no, for. No, they're jazz. Um, they're they're that's what they're they're wired for that. The anti-hunting groups, they, you know, the, they send out so much propaganda, help yeah. save the wolves with this cute little, little postcard with the with wolf pups on the front. Save the wolves. Are you kidding me? How come these groups don't care at all about the elk? Why don't they care about the deer numbers? Why don't they care about the devastation if, of the moose calves? Oh, the moose, the poor moose populations in so many states in the West, including areas of Canada, have just been decimated because of wolves. I yeah. want to know why they don't care about the other species. But it is, uh, it's, it is important, like you said, that we get involved um, with the conservation groups of your choice. It's a, it's it's simple too. If you don't have the time to do the research and get involved or volunteer, just become a member. Even your yeah. thirty five bucks a, a year is going to help the cause. And if you can take it to the next level, go to a local chapter banquet. You know, yes. buy those banquet tickets. Purchase some raffle tickets. Buy some. You know. Right now, the, the Mule Deer Foundation is getting their huge giveaway together. It's nine months long. It's the ultimate giveaway. They have got like 13 or 14 huge prize packages. And you buy tickets anywhere from one for 10 bucks. And the more you buy, the more you get. But then right. they give away these incredible prizes from a Polaris. My Skullbone prize package has 13 or 14 different items. It's over $13,000 in value. Uh, Nosler rifle, uh Magnum Research, Desert Eagle, like a uh, Baku scooter, all these big prizes all in one prize package. And that's nine months long. If you can buy tickets to that or go to a banquet or, you know, donate something to your local banquet, there's so there's easy ways to get involved that really do make a difference. And if we Absolutely. hunters don't stand tall together and start, you know, realizing that our lifestyle is being threatened, it's going to be gone before we know it. Yeah, 100% agree. And it's, it's not just, it's, it's all states. It's, it's everywhere yep, for sure. Yep. So where do, where was your goat hunt at? Uh, Utah, right here in Utah. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. And, yeah. In the Chalk Creek Camas unit. Um, it was, I wanted to DIY it of course. And, um, it was such a challenge. Um, but it was incredible. I mean, now that it's all come to fruition, uh, <laughs> it, if, if, it's funny, I have a video on my Instagram where I did, it was four days of scouting and then 13 mm -hmm. days of the hunt. And in that four days of scouting, we saw lots of goats. Um, in fact, we had a really big, beautiful Billy picked out. He was gorgeous. And uh, I saw him on the third and the fourth day of scouting. Then I had five days in between where I could hunt again because I had so much else going on in the fall. And Keith, my business partner, my cameraman couldn't get to Utah till five days later. So Okay, we'll start the hunt then. Well, unbeknownst to me, another hunter had this billy spotted and he got oh. out that weekend that I wasn't hunting, but that's hunting and that's how it yeah. goes. And I'm actually really excited for him. And, uh, um, but it was super challenging. We saw so many, um, so many nannies, tons of kids, which is great to see. Obviously right. the recruitment, you want to see lots of kids. Um, but yeah, if you, so I have a video on Instagram where I'm scouting and I, I pan over to this, I'm on top of this one mountain and then you pan over to this other mountain peak and I point to an arrow to where I ended up 13 days later killing my goat. And if you right. would have told me when we were scouting that I would have to climb to this sheer terrifying right. rock face and get my goat, I would have said, no way. Like there is no way I'm, I, I can't, I can't physically get up there, but 
we did it at one foot in front of the other. And it was, I never knew what a panic attack was until that day, but um, we got through it and I'm super excited. I'll be releasing that episode in two weeks um, on Carbon TV on Skullbone Chronicles. It'll be the Thanks. kickoff of season six. And uh, the footage is awesome. I only had Heath, my cameraman, with me for six out of those days. Ended up John, my husband, who calls himself my third string cameraman. He ended up, but he did an amazing job. The footage turned out great. And um, I was, I don't think I've ever been happier to get off a mountain as I was that night. <laughs> but I can imagine. it all turned out great. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard over and over and over, never been on a goat hunt or anything, but I've heard over and over that it's just that, uh, that there's a, an added level of danger there just because of the areas that you have to traverse to get there and where they live. Where I shot this goat. So I didn't think we'd get there. And John just said, we might as well go. We got, we can't really see what the terrain looks like way up there. It looked right. like there was a shelf we could walk across. The, and the problem is sometimes if you're on one side of the mountain and yeah, you can shoot across the other. Like when we got up to the saddle, if you will, there's the goat 200 yards away, pop shot. But I had to wait before the goat crossed this sheer, like it was just pebbles, rock face that then dropped straight off 1500 vertical drop off. And if I shot him in that slide, he was going to yeah. roll probably yeah. and die in the, you know, and I would never be able to get him. So right, I had to wait until... Left. He crossed either closer to us or further away to where there were some trees and boulders that would catch it. And we literally debated, like, can I can I walk across the top of there? And it looked like you could kind of shimmy. <laughs> and that's what we were doing yeah. across the top of that slide to get to him if I dropped him there. And uh, it was crazy. But it, like I said, it's, there's something about pushing yourself through those challenging times on a hunt. My, I'm looking to my left here at my bighorn ram hunt, same thing. It was 17 days, two days of scouting, 15 days of hunting. That when it was all said and done, it was it was truly like the most challenging times of my life, but the most rewarding too. And I, uh, I'm really, I feel so blessed that I have these moments in my life captured on film uh, to relive them, to share them, to maybe go to for some days when you need some inspiration. Um, They've just been highlights of my life. The most, the most epic season of Skullbone and all the years I've done it from nine years on the network to, to Chronicles, it, I put together an all veteran season last two years ago. So season four of Skullbone mm -hmm. Chronicles on Carbon. And by the way, Carbon TV is all free, 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 right. free, never charge. It's not like other platforms. They charge you 10 bucks a month. Nothing. It's all free. You can watch it on the app. You can plug it into your TV if you got any. They just signed a big deal with Vizio TV. So mm -hmm. anyone with a Vizio can put the app right in their main menu ne next to your Netflix, your Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, Roku stick, you can plug it right in your menu on your Roku menu. So now it is mainstream TV. But There's um, also an app app on your phone. Yep, and it, app it on your phone, together. free app on your phone. But I put together my 13 favorite veteran episodes I ever filmed. Every year I take out one or two combat veterans on some super special hunts everything from eric Galvin, who's a triple amputee to the very first one i did bo richenbeck a double amputee navy seal and we tell their military story through the hunt and uh i've just been so blessed to be on some incredible adventures and share campfires with combat veterans who have literally been through hell and back and persevered and um been lucky enough to take them on a lot of fantastic hunts. And uh, so season four is my all veteran season that if there's anything that I'm proud of, it's that season. And I would recommend anyone who, who uh, has some time on their hands and want to watch some pretty inspiring stories to, to go to season four of Chronicles and watch the veteran season. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, same thing. Uh, we, we say it all the time on here, you know, freedom isn't free and no. man, the veterans uh, hats off. Greatly appreciate it. All the sacrifices and and everything that they do, and and their families um, as well, to give us the ability to sit here and enjoy what we're talking about and and yep. doing this stuff. It's just uh, hats off. We we do a lot with veterans as well. And amen. And that's, it's kind of like actually like we were talking before about that disconnect with food. If you are not, uh, if you didn't come from a military family or you don't know close members who have been through combat and you haven't heard their stories, you might not have an appreciation for our country, for that flag, for the freedoms mm -hmm. that we all have. We, I feel like more than ever before in this culture that we're 
trapped in that there is such uh, college campuses, you name it. There is such a lack of appreciation for what our military goes through and the freedoms we have in this country that it's like that disconnect with food. If you don't have that connection or understanding, just basic understanding of what our military goes through, you won't appreciate the freedoms that we have. And guess what? Those are getting stripped away too. So I think there's a great connection between our military and our hunting gun lifestyle. And I love to be able to take these combat vets on hunts to tell their story so people can understand what they've been through both men and women, what they've been through in the military, and also then what what they're fighting for. And that's our freedom to have guns, our freedom to hunt, our yep. freedom of speech. That's all connected. And uh, it's been a real blessing to take some of these men and women on hunts. So, uh, But I really encourage anyone, I hope some of your listeners maybe aren't hunting or maybe they're just thinking of getting into hunting. Right. I hope that they can find that connection to what hunting truly means. And it's a connection to mother nature and a connection to our food, but it's also a connection back to our freedoms. Well, and I think that, um, to, to finish that thought, one thing I, uh, I agree with everything you just said, and I think it could have been, uh, you could have stopped right after there's a lack of appreciation. Like there in so every, like, yeah, period, because (laughs) there's so many different things that, that, that I think if people really knew the whole story, as we've been talking about here, they wouldn't have the feeling that they feel or the, the, the thoughts, not everybody, but, but some, but, um, but yeah, I completely and totally agree with you with regards to that. And the, 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 the veterans, um, we need to take better care of them as well. I, Amen. I, yeah, we certainly just, do. yeah, for sure. So this, this year, um, this season coming up with, uh, Skullbound Chronicles, uh, goat hunt, what other hunts do we have to look forward to? Oh, we've got a fun waterfall show. And let me just say, I am not a waterfowler. And, uh, but I've been having a lot of fun this last month going out here on Utah Lake with my buddy, Richie Gonzalez. Um, and in his buddies, uh, his airboat, um, that's going to be, I think the second episode of fun waterfall hunt. And you can see me miss a million times and, (laughs) but it's still fun. Like, you know, one thing I, I really try to encourage people when I'm talking to them on social media or at one of the shows is I get that question probably more than any is how do I get my kids involved or how do I get my wife to go with me and really just let them come along and, and let them know you don't you don't have to throw a weapon in their hands right away. Just let them no. shadow you. And then if they do, you know, decide to go turkey hunting or, or waterfall hunting or pick up a bow, you know, you don't have to be an expert. You're not going to walk no. out and be an expert. I'm still like. I'm still learning. I feel like I've Absolutely. been in this my whole life and I'm still learning. And uh, I had, I, I can literally count on one t- hand how many times I've waterfall hunted. Well, we had so much fun out there and we might go one more time. So it'd be like a three days and one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's one of the things I think it's important for people to understand that it, it's a, it's an evolution. It's a process of becoming a hunter in whatever weapon or species you choose and to not feel intimidated. It's a learning process for everybody. Um, yeah. And, and this industry is really good, uh, the hunting world and also the shooting world. Um, they're v- for the most part, there's outliers, but for helping people. And, and if you want to come, um, you know, hunt and learn to hunt, absolutely. This year we've, I've had um, a couple of different times where we've had um, people, you know, younger kids that were you know, needed a spot to hunt and didn't have a spot to hunt because it's, you know, it's getting tougher and tougher to find places to hunt around yeah. here. Um, and so absolutely feel free to come. No problem. Get them set up. That's what it's all about. And, and you're, you're totally right. That's why it's called hunting, not killing. Um, yeah. and it's not, there's no guarantee. Um, j- just when you think you've got them figured out, um, that yeah. there, it doesn't work like it did the last time. And, and you're going to make uh, mistakes and you're going to screw up and you're going to, you know, that wind's going to swirl and all, all of the above. And yeah. you just have to embrace it all. You know, yeah. uh, you have to do your best. You have to train as much as you can shoot that bow, shoot that pistol, whatever. But, you know, the, you just have to embrace the whole process, I feel. Yeah, but, 100%. Yeah. And getting kids um, involved, you, you're exactly right. Just, just take them. Um, yeah. just, just start with, you know, if you're going out to fill feeders or you're going out to, yep. you know, to check, check trail camera camp. pictures or, you know, whatever, um, you know, you're going to do a food plot or whatever. Um, just take them out and introduce them. And that's, I mean, that's, I can speak from experience that, you know, I, I cut my teeth, uh, upland bird hunting and I can Me remember too. walking 
Yep. And that was it. I was young <laughs> yep. and my legs felt like they were going to fall off. You know, we probably walked three or four miles. Um, but then, you know, you grad, then, then, then I was able to carry a BB gun. So that was, you know, I thought I was, you know, uh, I thought I was talking, you know, I, oh, yeah. I was walking, walking in tall water. So, uh, you know, and then I got old enough where I could actually carry a single shot shotgun. And man, that seemed like, I, I mean, I could, it's a vivid memory today that I can look back and I can remember that I can tell you the field it was in. I can tell you who was with me. I can tell you where every bird got up, where, who shot. I can tell you, I have that memory. It is 100% ingrained. ingrained. Yeah. And, and that literally just you know, that, that, that set, set it. I mean, it, the the hook was set. Yeah. for me too. That's yeah. me too. And I've been, I've been so blessed to hunt the world and it started out walk, upland game bird. It did. Mm -hmm. I used to go yeah. to South Dakota in fifth and sixth grade. I would drive over to South Dakota with my dad and, you know, all of his buddies, my dad, he for 50 years had a tradition of going to South Dakota for the bird hunt every year from mm -hmm. Wisconsin. And, uh, I didn't even carry a gun. I literally walked the pheasant fields, like you said. I was mm -hmm. the official bird gutter, and I thought that was like the most important job. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, my dad always joked, Jana does not feel dress anything. She autopsies everything, you know. And but that's where else do you get to do that kind of thing as a kid? You know, it's so cool. You might get a frog in science class, but that does not compare. And right. uh, so, yeah, it's let them shadow you, take them along, like you said, check in trail cams, food plots, whatever. It doesn't have to be, you know, all of a sudden sticking a 12 gauge shotgun in their hands and you know, a yeah. turkey call, um, take, no. take them along, let them shadow for even a we, year or two. That's why the mentorship program is so, is so wonderful. Um, there's a mentorship program in mo most states now where you don't have to go through hunter safety if you're going with a licensed mentor. Yes. And it's basically the shadowing program. When yep. you take someone out, obviously you're going to want to teach them about, if you're turkey hunting, for example, how the shotgun works, patterning the shotgun. You're teaching them about turkey calls, movement, what you can and can't get away with, you know, decoys, all the things that go involved in it. And uh, whether they want to have a shotgun in their hands the first year or not, I mean, that's that's how I started. And I think I think it it, it doesn't have to be intimidating. Like a lot of, I hear from a lot of women and kids who maybe are a little bit intimidated or afraid. It doesn't have to be. Um, yeah. Back to 2024, it's going to be a crazy year, uh, crazier than I've had the last few years. I've got three really exciting veteran hunts. I'm taking okay. um, Air Force Special Forces a combat controller. His name is Rob Gutierrez. He is a legend in the combat controller world. His story is incredible. He is basically attributed to saving 16 men's lives. Um, I'm taking him on his very first elk archery hunt at RNK, Wyoming. It's a beautiful outfitter that has been so gracious to let me take so many veterans there. Um, they have great elk numbers too. It's just fantastic lodge all around going to be a great hunt for Rob. Um, I'm hopefully going to line up a hunt with Pat Payne. He is a Medal of Honor recipient. Um, where I don't know what I'm going to line up yet. We haven't, I haven't gone that far, but we've discussed on the phone, like, he would love to do anything. I'm hoping to line up either a Utah mule deer hunt or maybe a whitetail hunt somewhere. I'm take I'm doing a Folds of Honor hunt that is being auctioned off at the Hunt Expo in Salt Lake City in February. Folds of Honor is an incredible veteran organization that is dedicated at providing scholarships uh, for uh, Gold Star recipient families, or in other words, families who've lost a parent to the war uh, or first responders. And so that'll be a fun hunt for whoever wins that one. Uh, all proceeds going to Folds of Honor and Mule Deer Foundation. Um, I'm going Alaska to uh, Prince of Wales Black Bear Tag that we already have. I did a fall bear hunt there a couple years ago. This is going to be spring. Totally different style of hunt. You right. take the skiff out on the water. You're looking for black bears cruising the, the shoreline. Um, I'm doing Alaska Grizzly this June. Uh, we've been planning that for two years. So that'll be really exciting. Nice. Um, hopefully Iowa muzzleloader in December, if I draw, should draw, uh, with Whitetail Extreme. They're an incredible outfit out of Iowa that I've hunted with before. Got a great buck there two, two years ago, three years ago. Um, and then Montana, hopefully I'll draw antelope, uh, hopefully general deer and elk in, in Montana. And then of course I run my baits in Idaho every year with my buddy Heath for bears and a Montana bear. So it's a pretty crazy Got a full schedule. Year. 
it's a crazy year more than normal, but my 2023 was probably the lightest year I've had in, in a long time. So we're making up for it in 2024. Right. Well, and here we are in early January and obviously all the conventions are, are getting ready to kick off. Um, yep. we've got, uh, we're, we'll be at, uh, ATA and also shot, uh, show, oh, yeah. uh, here towards the end of the month. So, um, it's, it's going to be a, a busy year for us as well. We're, we're, we're growing. We just, um, um, we just turned our website on. So it just went live. Uh, powder. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. So we've been basically coming up on, like I said, real quick on three years of just, you know, no internet. Um, we wanted to make sure that we got it done right. We still have a few kinks to work out, but, um, it is live and, it, and you can, you can actually shop from it now. So, um, we're super Great. excited for that and yeah. we're expanding, you know, to, to add the archery and, and, um, hopefully this year as well, we'll also have our indoor archery range, uh, live and going as well. So we're super, oh, nice. super excited for all of that, um, yeah. as well. So 2024 is going to be a busy one for us as well. That's big, big plans. That's exciting. Especially indoor archery range. Great for the kids. And yeah, get, get absolutely. Practice. A lot of people don't have, most people have 10 yards, you know, but just to feel more comfortable and safe indoor, like where, yeah, uh, especially starting out archery. I've talked to tons of women in the last 30 years. It's nice to have that indoor range um, mm -hmm. to feel comfortable, take some lessons, you know, at, try a variety of bows out, see what you're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's so exciting for you guys. Yeah. Hopefully, it, it, like I said, the range, hopefully we can get it done. We have the spot, we have the, everything. It's just a matter of getting all of the, you know, all of the, the checklist, I guess, working down the Maybe checklist. Of all those things. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so I want to talk a little bit more about your, your pistol hunting and yeah. Oh yeah. And, yeah. So, um, like I said, it was introduced to Magnum research at shot show, uh, probably six years ago. Are you going to be at uh, shot this year? Pardon me? Are you going to be at shot show this year? I think I will. I, I, so we're only about five hours from there here in Utah. So I think I'm going to go for probably just Wednesday, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure I'll be there. Um, the shows I will be at for sure is the wild sheep foundation show in Reno. That's January. I will be at hunt expo in Salt Lake city in February. I'll be emceeing Saturday night's huge banquet. So that's always so much fun. And my husband's the auctioneer. So makes it doubly fun. Um, I don't think I'm going to make it to NWTF, which is a bummer. I haven't been there since COVID struck. I used to go every single year. It's such a great show. Um, it's just so much, it's just hard to, with travel. And mm -hmm. then you know, then my spring bear season kicks in and I run my own baits at Idaho and now I have to travel back and forth to Montana and I'm doing Prince of Wales and I'm doing Alaska. And so it's like, okay, do I want to be gone all of March? And I'm going to see my dad. It's my, my dad time in Florida. So it's just hard. If I did every show I wanted to do, I would never, ever, ever be home. Right. And uh, so uh, I don't think I'm doing NWTF this year, but I think I'll be at shot. Cool. Yeah. Maybe we'll run into yeah. you. Yeah. So I started met Magnum Research. Um, I got their 429 Desert Eagle. I actually got it's it's actually a gun that has four interchangeable barrels. It's amazing. It's a 357 50 cal, which I've not put I've never put the 50 cal on. It's a little much. But I've hunted with the 429 and I've shot multiple bears, mountain lions, uh javelina hogs, uh turkey. Mm -hmm. I shot a <laughs> I was like, did you even have any of the turkey left? Yes. It's like an arrow. It goes through and through. Um, but I did a turkey hunt in Texas where you can hunt with anything in Texas. Um, but it was super fun. I mainly, um, I had hurt my shoulder. It was super hard to even stabilize this arm for archery for a year. That's when I got into pistol hunting and I've just really grown to love it. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, but I just got my new 3030. So it's my first revolver I've ever had. And I'm kind of excited to hunt with that this spring. Yeah. So with regards to what are the similarities with regards to archery hunting and pistol hunting? Yeah. For me, it's the same distance. You know, I know people who can shoot way over 50 yards. I just personally don't. I don't, mm -hmm. pull, I pull 50 pounds. I don't pull more than that. And I have archery, elk, deer, antelope, muleys, whatever, spot and stalk, tons of bears. I just don't feel comfortable when it comes to shooting more than 50 yards. I think too many factors come to play when uh, heart rate, everything. A lot of guys shoot a lot farther than that. Me with my pistol, it's the same. I don't want to shoot 50 yards. I'd like to shoot 30. When I, like, for example, with bear baiting, our barrel is only about 25 yards from the site. And that's a whole nother 
podcast we could totally do. People who they think baiting bears is like, oh, are people, I didn't get one this year. And there's been right. a lot of other years that I didn't, I, I passed on seven really good bears, but I was waiting for fat, fatty, fatty McPherson, who actually that's the name of a different bear. I think we called him fatty. Well, he's still out there, I hope. But um, on trail camera, smart, smart, big, fat old bear. But mm -hmm. um, no, you just never know. I've had plenty of sits where nothing comes in. Just because you bait them, they're smart. You know, you're just hoping that one day either a sow walks in and they follow her in or they let their, you know, their bellies override their brains. And they come in and they want the right. sweets. But um I don't, yeah. So with pistol hunting in terms, I, I've only spot and stalked hogs and javelina. Um, otherwise, I know my distance. I know, you know, the bears are going to be under 30 yards. But I feel comfortable with that gun out to 50 yards. I, they're both sighted out. I've got uh, the Vortex 3 MOA sight on the Desert Eagle. I put the new Crossfire sight on the BFR, the 3030. So, you know, you've got a sight. Um, I just don't feel comfortable over 50. I know guys who shot big game over at a hundred yards with the desert eagle for me personally right. i don't see that well first of all i'm getting old um, <laughs> yeah. but Doesn't that I, suck? Uh, I like a controlled environment let's just say <laughs> yeah yeah i i can totally relate as you i'm wearing glasses and man that was about three years ago and it was just like all of a sudden it was just a switch flipped and oh i'm there I'm i at, hate it and i'm i can still kind of get away um sometimes i need readers um, but definitely that distance vision is is fa fading fast, and it stinks when you when you're a hunter because you're you're looking up close, you're dialing that turret, or yep. you're looking at your you That's... know through your sight, and then you're looking far away. And anyone knows when you're going back and forth, if you're starting the... to have challenges in the far and the near, it messes with you. It's, and then I... the binoculars. That's oh, a whole nother. Oh yeah, for sure. And so I'm... you're just oh. Yeah, yeah, we're living through the spotters go. I'm right there where I'm going to have to start carrying readers with me. And it's such a bummer. I've tried one time I tried to put, go to contacts. And that's a funny story. But um, my adult daughter um, was at, she works, uh, she runs our restaurant and bar. And uh, my wife was out of town at the time. And so I got contacts and I was able to get them in, you know, at the eye doctor after, you know, an hour. And then they were like, all right, well, now you got to take them out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, really? Took them out, put them back in. So two hours later, I go in, my daughter, and she's like, you know, she wears contacts. So I get home that night, and she's making fun of me and everything because I'm freaking out because something's in my eye. Get home that night, and I can't get it out. I can't get the <laughs> contact out, and I'm starting to frank hard. Like I'm, I'm really starting to, you know, get, get to, to, to wig out. And so she has to come over and take the contact out for me here. So here's my daughter, you know, making fun of me, taking the contact out and I just can't stand having anything in my eye. So yeah, I, I was like a little kid, you know, so here I am with glasses and I try not to wear them, but uh, know, I'm going to make right that there. effort again. I'm going to make the effort again for contacts just, and it, and genuinely it's because of the, just what you said, the hunting yeah. going from, you know, trying to even, you know, you get used to the, to the bifocals, but I remember the first year deer hunting, with bifocals, I literally ate shit twice in the woods. <laughs> just couldn't, I, I look like a, you know, like somebody just learning to walk. I just ate, yeah. you know, just fell over. And it was just, it was just trying to learn. And then from there, you know, the, the contact, I mean, the, the, the binoculars and stuff, range yeah. finder, it just, it adds a whole different element to it. And it's just, it's, a, it's frustrating, but. Yeah. I feel know? like if I get to the point where I really need them glasses for far i'm having late i'm gonna have lace it yeah but i've I'm looked not at that there yet but it definitely the move back and forth is becoming a little challenging yeah i've i've looked or i've talked to him about that and, and unless something's changed in the last year or so um because i haven't been to the eye doctor but you're only you can only do it a couple two or three times yeah and so they're yeah like, have you had it done no i've not I, oh. I, and they said they could get it to where i would be back to where i was and i wouldn't have to wear glasses but i'm also kind of a little gun shy with you finally got two or three chances yeah, um, yeah, you know, like, exactly. And they, I don't think they have LASIK for presbyopia yet, which is where you need your reader right. short arm syndrome or short, short arm syndrome. Right. Um, yeah. I don't think they have it for that yet. Someday. There was but, some. The last time I was there was some eye drop that you could put in for. I think it was up close. Really? It, yeah, it's literally like an eye drop. Like you put oh, this I'll eye drop in, but it it only lasted for like 
four to seven hours or eight hours or something. And it was, you know, it's, it, it's available, but, um, huh. it, it, I, I think it's, that. I don't know that they have all the kinks worked completely out yeah. of it yet, but, but, uh, yeah, I was, when they said that it's something to do with it, it does something with the muscles in your eye, which allows it to, to work differently or to something. relax and different. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, I, vision is yeah. Glasses it's in, in the field is just a whole nother thing yeah. for sure. So I just wanted to tell you, thank you for coming on here. It's been great talking to you. Um, didn't seem like we've been talking for an hour. And uh, if if you're at SHOT Show, definitely want to try to, to to meet up with you and and uh, then meet in person. Um, yeah. So for all of our listeners out there that aren't familiar with you, uh, with where to find you and all your social media different accounts, if you want to maybe tell them a little bit about it, obviously we'll put it in the comments. And then whenever um, this, this podcast goes live, then you can share it on all of your social media pages and stuff. But oh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate wanna... that. Yeah, I'm basically on just Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, I'm Skullbound TV. On Facebook, I believe I ch- they allowed me to change it to Chronicles. But Skullbound TV and Skullbound Chronicles is essentially the same thing. But Chronicles... If you, the easiest way to think of it is Chronicles is my digital show. So it could be a five minute episode, a half hour episode. You know, you never Mm -hmm. know. Um, On Carbon TV, like YouTube, you can put together your episode and and tell the story however you want versus network TV. Um, When I was on network, it was Skullbound. Now it's Skullbound Chronicles. When they then are out for a year, they shift over to my fast channel, Skullbound TV also on Carbon TV and all the other networks to where you can just put it on, leave it on. You have to go through commercials, but it's like a regular, you know, Discovery Channel, whatever, you know, Animal Planet Channel, whatever. It's just like that where you don't get to pick and choose. It just runs. But they, uh, social media, yeah, I'm sorry, getting a little winded. Um, no. Skullbone TV on Instagram, Skullbone Chronicles on Facebook, and Skullbone TV, I think, on Twitter. And it's just me. So like, if you reach out, I try to get back to everybody. If you have any questions about gear or, you know, in a hunt or where to go, if you want to come out West, um, I, uh, it's just me. I might take a few days getting back to you, but I run my own social and, uh, I really like communicating with everybody and, and, uh, and then if they want to watch my episodes, it's on carbon TV, the always free carbon TV app on your phone, or you can put it on your TV, whether yep. you air cast it from your smartphone or you put it in your menu. If you have a Roku stick, a fire stick, um, Vizio TV, uh, all Samsung TVs, I think 2017 or newer, you can just put it right there in your menu next to your Netflix and Amazon. Yep. Yep. I appreciate that very much again. And, uh, we're kind of in the same, same boat for the listeners out there that haven't maybe, um, you know, gone to social media and found us yet, but we're the same. We're on, uh, Instagram and Facebook and, uh, Twitter as well. Uh, we're also on YouTube. Um, and then our podcasts are anywhere that you, you know, download your podcast. So if you're listening to this, you probably have already found us, but we're on Apple and, um, Spotify and all those different uh, channels. And again, we are working with carbon and, uh, our website powder, powder and string, uh, com uh, just went live. So you can go on there and there's links to all of our different social media pages there as well. So nice. I greatly, well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a yeah. fun chat. I, like I said, I could sit and chat hunting yeah. all day long. Uh, it wasn't even like, I feel like I've been sitting down for five minutes with you. So I, I really appreciate you reaching Time out. Flies. Hopefully we'll meet at shot show yes. and maybe we could do another one in the past and talk about the 2024 season after it's complete. Absolutely. I look forward to it and I uh, greatly appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Jana. You have a great day. Thank you. You too.